Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic this series is Ministry in the Spirit. Throughout the whole series of the Sword of the Spirit, we emphasize the sword of God's Word, that is the Scripture, and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word and the Spirit operate together. And in this topic, Ministry in the Spirit, we're going to see how that works practically in your life as you begin the exciting adventure to become a servant of Christ, a minister in the Holy Spirit. Now in this series we'll be showing how that every single believer is called to serve Jesus. We have all received the Holy Spirit. We have all been equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we can become servants of Christ and servants of one another. Ministry is really all about service, which means that we recognize, first of all, that we have been saved to serve. We have been saved by grace, through faith in Christ, for the purpose of serving Him. Now our service is something so special to Jesus because he was and still remains the greatest servant of all. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now of course Jesus' death on the cross, his sacrifice was his ultimate service to God. He surrendered his life for us that we might be saved. Now you and I are called to follow Jesus, to take up our own cross and to follow him. That's the life of a disciple. And it will mean that we will follow Jesus Christ in his ministry. We'll want to be like him. He's the great servant. He served others even right until the very last moment when he washed his disciples' feet. He served others by healing the sick, and by sharing the word and comforting the bereaved, doing everything that speaks of loving service and dedication of his life to others. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, have been called to lay down our lives in the same way. We can't do this but by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing, which implies that joined to him, united with him by the Holy Spirit, we can do all things. And so I invite you to join with me on this exciting adventure of discovery, a life of service in the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to this Sword of the Spirit training session. And the subject we're going to be looking at in this part of the series is Ministry in the Holy Spirit. We have also got a session entitled Knowing the Spirit. And uh, that really should be watched and listened to in conjunction with this series on ministry in the Spirit. Because if we know the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be able to minister in the Holy Spirit. And I want to say something straight away because it comes out in the manual in uh, one of the sessions, but I want to bring it right up the front here and say, when I talk about ministry in the Spirit, I'm not suggesting that there's ministry in any other way. All ministry must be in the Holy Spirit. So we come to this teaching series with a very clear dependence on the Holy Spirit to touch our lives, to empower us, and to give us insights in how to minister like Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me say this first of all. God, it seems, has given human beings an innate sense of compassion. We have our hearts which are so easily moved, particularly if we're sensitive to the needs around us, when we see news of war-torn Europe, great devastations globally, locally, politically, spiritually, and individual lives as well. And something in us as human beings is moved with compassion. 
But we know Jesus Christ is the God of all compassion, and His Spirit is the Spirit of compassion. And when the Holy Spirit's upon us, that compassion, as we see the needs around us, is deeper than ever before. Just as Jesus ministered in and out of compassion, so we too minister by compassion, the compassion of the Holy Spirit. Now, when the anointing of the Spirit is on you, and that compassion is within you, you have all the ingredients for ministry in the Holy Spirit. And so my encouragement to you as we begin this series is to open your heart to the Holy Spirit and open your heart to the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ because He's going to anoint you and empower you and equip you to minister to those in need. And I want you to understand this from the very, very beginning. We have been called to meet the needs of those around us. We've been called to minister in Jesus' name, and we've been called to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not teaching just for those who will consider themselves to be leaders in the body of Christ. This is teaching for all God's people, because we're all called to be servants and all called to be ministers. Now, I want you to begin in part one, ministry in the Spirit. Now, we all know the term ministry. It's widely used today. We talk about Christian ministry. We talk about ministering. We talk about the ministry. Uh, now, in some traditions, this is so emphasized as being uh, for those who are set apart perhaps as ministers. You know what I'm talking about? Ordained clergymen, dog collars, that, that kind of thing. And uh, while there is a place, indeed, for those who are set aside for special works of ministry, such as preaching and teaching and church leadership, nevertheless, this term ministry must apply to every believer. Now, we're going to begin the study of ministry in the Spirit by looking at several words for ministry in the New Testament. Now, just in case you're coming fresh to this kind of teaching, to this kind of approach, let me remind you that the New Testament was written in Greek. And there are many Greek words that underline, uh, underlie some of the English words that we used. And that there are three words in the Greek which are translated as ministry or ministering in one way or another. And we're going to look at these three words. The first word here it is diakonos, diakonos. And it's the Greek word for an ordinary house servant, for somebody who would sweep the floor, prepare food, serve at tables, wash dishes, and so on. And now, you may be thinking straight away, but when I'm talking about ministry, I don't, I'm not thinking about washing up. I want to be a Mary, not a Martha. I want to sit at the feet of Jesus. I don't want to be stuck in the kitchen. And maybe you've come to the Bible college in order to escape the kitchen. But let me tell you, ministry, ministry is about practical, humble acts of service. Now, in your manual, I've given you many scripture references to the word diakonos. It's translated as minister. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, and it says then, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? but ministers, servants, through whom you believed. Now, if the word minister is some great self-exalting word, that verse wouldn't make sense. Paul is writing to a group of believers in Corinth who have overemphasized ministers. And they have their favorite ministers. You know, it's a bit like today in the charismatic movement. Everybody's got their favorite minister, their favorite teacher, and, and they really overemphasize, I think, personalities. And Paul says, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? And who is the rest of us? We're only servants. And he uses the word diakonos, which means we're only waiters, table servants. We're dishwashers. We're, we're floor cleaners. That's what we are. And we are servants, of course, through whom you believed. He dignifies it. He doesn't minimize it. But he says, there's a valuable ministry we have, but we are only servants. And so, in some Bibles, you find this word diakonos uh, translated as attendant or deacon. It's, in fact, where we get the English word deacon from, and I'll maybe touch on that a little later on. The verb diakone, diakoneo means to serve, 
and again it's usually translated as to minister. And we can see this word used in a host of practical ways, but it's also used of spiritual ministry to show us that when we minister in the Spirit, we don't have to be so spiritually minded, so totally unreal as if we're floating six feet off the floor. No, ministry in the Spirit is about serving people with all the humility of a table servant. It's the word used of Jesus in Matthew 20 and verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here we have it again in Romans 15 verse 25. The Apostle Paul says, Now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now what is he talking about? Is he going to preach sermons, cast out demons, heal the sick? Well, I guess so. He had that in his mind. But we know in context that the ministry that Paul was going to engage in at Jerusalem was ministering to the poor saints. He was actually delivering aid. He was bringing financial assistance. Interesting, isn't it? How this word diakonos and diakoneo can be used of Jesus himself, the great ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the great ministry of the Apostle Paul, but it actually means somebody who waits at tables serving. So this word describes the humble attitude that we should have towards ourselves and our service or ministry. Just to complete the word group, we have diakonia, which is the uh, noun form here, of, means serving or service. And uh, it really is talking again about menial service. And this word is used of the apostles, great apostles. It's used of every, you know, ordinary believers. It's used of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit ministers. It's used of angels. Do you know that verse in, one, uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, speaking about the angels? It says, Are there not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? You know, we are the object of angelic ministry. And... Uh, Characteristically, angels minister to us unawares. We don't know it, but they do. One day we'll see the video replays in heaven and we'll see how much we were dependent upon angelic intervention in our lives in one way or another. Don't get carried away with that, but it's a fact. Preachers and teachers are also called ministers and they are involved in ministry. So ministry of the word, ministry of food aid, Serving others in any capacity describes this word diakonos. So it shows us that what should control our thinking in all ministry is not that we somehow are masters with great spiritual gifts and the whole world has got to sit at our feet. It means that we are anointed to, for humble acts of service. To minister does not mean to command. It means that ministry is not a high, exalted, high-status superstar office. No, no, no. It's a humble doing what Jesus did. And so our thinking about ministry should begin with this word, diakono, diakonos, deacon, servant, and that should control everything in our ministry. Now, the second word, leturgos, leturgos. Now, this is only used occasionally to identify a minister, one who ministers. And uh, it carries a different meaning from diakonos. Leturgos is the Greek word for an important public servant, for someone who carries out a public office, and characteristically, this person did it at their own expense. But it was a high position, public office, which they voluntarily performed. Now, diakonos, diakonia, describes full-time, low-status, low-paid, private serving by someone who is directed by their employer. Now, liturgia refers to part-time, high-status, unpaid public service. 
And we need both these words to balance our understanding of ministry. Because ministry is at the same time both a lowly thing that we do as we wash people's feet, as we care for the needs of others. It's the work of a servant, but on the other hand, it is a high and exalted privilege. And we need both these words to get a full picture of, uh, uh, of ministry. This word is used of Christ, it's used of Paul, it's used of Epaphroditus, it's used of prophets and teachers at Antioch, it's used of the Gentile churches and their attitude towards Jewish believers, it's used of the practical responsibilities of believers to each other. So it seems to be used in the, in the full way that diakonos is used, but it's hinting at something slightly different. Okay, what is it hinting at? I don't think it is trying to puff us up with self-importance and high status, that would be contradicting the use of the word diakonos. No, it's associated actually with another key thought for ministry. Let me pause and say to you, what a tragedy today that in the minds of so-called official ministers and also ordinary congregational members, that uh, the attitude towards ministry is much more dominated by the idea of liturgos, high important status. Look at me, I'm a minister. You better call me reverend and the rest of it. What a pity. And that's not what this word really is wanting, or God wants this word to convey to us. This word in the New Testament, I believe, wants to convey to us that... When we minister, we don't minister for our benefit. It reminds us also that minister is, ministry is important. It's very important. It's a high privilege to minister, whatever it is, even handing somebody a cup of water in the name of Jesus. It also can be public. And uh, I think another key thought is that a liturgos minister is one who is representing the public. They are a public servant. So it has a representative nature. So that when we are serving, we are representing others. In, 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 we are, so it's public service, representative service. Now I said there were three words. Here's the third one. Huperetes. Huperetes. And again, that's translated often as minister. And it's a very interesting word again. It literally means under rower, under rower. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Ben Hur, when um, he is he is a rower. Have you seen that that scene and the, the man's beating the drum and he's having to row? An under rower. That's a picture of ministry. Are you ready? Get the sweat rags out. It's hard work. But the key thought about this word huperetes, under rower. It, 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 the key thought here is that you are ministering under authority, an under rower. You are a subordinate. All ministry must be conducted with this attitude of being under authority. Sometimes we think of ministry as exercising authority. The ministers are the ones who get to tell other people what to do. No, 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 no. That's not Jesus' teaching. A minister... And all ministry, whether it is those who are selected for full-time ministry and anointed and appointed for full-time preaching and teaching and so forth, or whether it is the ministry which is there for all of us as believers, whatever the ministry is, we are under authority. And so huperetes was used in a kind of popular and colloquial way in the New Testament times as a subordinate or anybody who was under the direction of another person. So if you see somebody who is a subordinate under direction, just say, there goes Huperetes. And they will look at you and say, what are you talking about? But you will know. You will know. And there's a, a list of some of the people that are described as this in the New Testament. There's the synagogue attendant. There's Mark himself. There's King David Let's turn to that scripture, Acts 13, 36. It's interesting to think of King David in this respect. Acts 13, 36. 
for David after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. Okay, basically, here's the reference to David saying he is an under rower. He served the purposes of God in his generation. So he wasn't ruling. See, this picture of King David, who is the, who is the prototypical pattern for the Messiah. When Messiah came, he is known as the son of David. That was a messianic description. And so King David, the greatest of all the Old Testament kings, is described as an under rower because he was serving the purposes of God. And here's something I want you to grasp, grasp right away. When you minister, you are serving God. You are serving the purposes of God. It's all about you being in submission to the Holy Spirit. And that should excite you because of a great opportunity. Then, of course, it's used of Paul himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. And uh, don't forget, uh, I've already spoken to you about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is very much the same context. Paul is still speaking to the same people who were elevating ministers and servants of the Lord and putting them on pedestals. And uh, he says, let 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, let a man so consider us as under rowers of Christ, servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. And in both those words, the word for steward and the word for servant here, which is under rower, both those words have this idea of being submitted to authority because a steward has to account for his stewardship. And so, can you see, we are starting with a well-needed dose of humility. And let, let me just tell you something. And with this topic, I'm going to have to be careful because if I step aside, whenever I step aside of this podium here, you know that I'm stepping aside and from, from some of the notes and things. And uh, if I do this too much, we're not going to get through it. We've got to get through the teaching. But I can't resist this one. I remember the first time God used me to open the eyes of the blind. It was not in a big, spectacular Hollywood production of a meeting. Hello. There were no violins and strings. There were no classical pianists. I was in a mud hut in the middle of the Rift Valley in Kenya, Africa. And yet, that woman's eyes were opened instantly and perfectly by the power of God. Now that does something to you. That does something to you. It challenges you, blesses you, but you've got to remember in your mind always, you've got to keep yourself low. If you allow even the slightest hint of pride to enter in, you're going to quench the Holy Spirit for good, really. So that's why I'm saying all the glory goes to Jesus because you are only doing what he is enabling you to do and you minister in total submission to the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you learn that lesson, you have mastered this whole course. So, Huperetes stresses that ministers are not people in charge of their own ministry. Don't ever talk about your ministry. You don't have a ministry. The Spirit of God has the ministry. Jesus has the ministry. And you're in submission to Him. So we're not in charge of our own activities. We're not ministering out of our own authority. We're not doing our own thing. No, we are under rowers and we are under the leadership and direction of Jesus Christ. So now let's bring these three words together. Diakonos, liturgos, and uh, huperetes. And recap on what they teach us. Now, diakonos shows the link between ministers and their serving work. Leturgos emphasizes 
the representative nature of our service and the high privilege that is ours to serve Jesus. And Huperetes stresses our serving relationship with Jesus, who is our superior. We are under him and in submission to him. And so, we have to really begin our understanding of ministry in humble servanthood. It's got to be that which dominates. Now, there are a few other words I want to bring to your attention. Not every word that is related to serving or ministering actually is translated as minister. So you've got to understand that. That's why it's good to know these words. So I'm giving you these words, and I might be stretching some of you throughout this course to, to do that. But this is a Bible training program, and I want you really to learn some of these words. They're not that difficult. Do loss. Do loss. Servant. Now, this is contrast to diakonos, which also means servant, because this one means bond servant. Slave is the best translation. A servant who is owned by his master is a doulos. A slave. Diakonos would get paid. Not much, but get paid. But a slave never got paid. Uh, now, what is the difference between these things? Doulos and diakonos. What is the difference? The emphasis on doulos is relationship. It talks about a relationship in which the slave is owned by the master. And diakonos emphasizes the activity of service. So that's a very good distinction to, to bear in mind. And we are both. We are owned and controlled by God. Now, the Apostle Paul makes this clear. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, uses the word doulos, bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And that brings today's teaching on ministry in the Spirit to a close. I pray that over these programs, God has begun to show you what it means to minister for Him, to be a true servant of Jesus Christ, and to do so in the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Till next time, God bless you.
Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Ministry in the Spirit. We're looking at how you and I as followers of Christ are called to be servants, to serve Him and to serve one another. We're following in the footsteps of Jesus who is the great servant. He loved people. He served people even to the point of laying down his very life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now, because that sacrifice has been paid, there is no more sacrifice needed for the forgiveness of sins. So our service to God and to one another is not in order to make ourselves right with God or to make ourselves acceptable before him. No, our service of God flows out of the loving gratitude we have in our hearts because he has saved us, because he has drawn us to himself and given us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, so that we might be like him. Now when we talk about ministry in the Spirit, we're talking about serving God in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we can become like Jesus. In the last teaching, I was talking about some of the words that are used in the New Testament to describe servanthood or service unto God. And we find that there is a rich vocabulary describing every aspect of our service to God. We are simple servants. The word is the same word used of those who wait at tables. Simple servants. Simply doing what we can to make life easier and more pleasurable for other people. To serve one another. We also see that there's a stronger word used. It's the word slave. And a slave is totally the possession of the master. This means because we are totally owned by Christ, we are his slaves. But it's not a slavery which brings pain and degradation. It's not a negative slavery. It's the slavery of love. Because we so love God and so love Jesus, we are ready to do his every bidding. You see, a slave obeys the master. The slave puts the master's needs above his own. The slave is totally subject to the will of the master. So when we are ministers and servants of Christ by the Holy Spirit, it all begins with the surrender of our lives to the master. It's a joyful surrender because we love him, we serve him, and we serve him with all of our hearts. So as we continue in this teaching, we're going to pick up on a few more words that describe our service. Ephesians 6 verse 6, speaking of slaves actually, but it uh, applies to all acts of service, if we can do them unto the Lord, it says, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So he says, you're slaves. You are owned by your masters. He is speaking to slaves. But he says, you are to serve your masters as if you were, as you really are, slaves of Jesus Christ. Now, wouldn't that have just revolutionized the ancient world? When the slaves perhaps the most unjust form of all human relationships, didn't stand upon their rights. They just said, I have no rights. I belong to my master, and I'm going to serve my earthly master as I would want to serve my heavenly master because he really is my master. And let me tell you something else. I'm coming this side again. If you are truly a bond servant of Jesus Christ, you can never, ever be a slave to anyone or anything. Because serving and being a slave of Jesus sets you free from every other form of slavery. Remember that. That's for good measure today. All right. So we are owned 
by God, and we are therefore called to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and to serve one another. Look at Galatians 5 and verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's the verbal form here. By love be slaves of one another. Have you heard the expression, I'm not your slave? Hello? Well, in the body of Christ, we are. Because we love Jesus so much, we want to be like him, and he served in exactly that same spirit. He said, the Father owns me totally. All that I have is His. I only say what He says, only do what He does. I'm serving Him. So, these words are vital for our understanding. Now, there's another word which is also not translated minister. I'm giving you the three words that are translated minister. And I'm giving you two words that are not translated minister. The first word is doulos. second word is latris. It's not translated minister in the, in the English Bibles, but it is, has to do with ministry. Now, latris is a hired servant. It's from the verb latreo, which means to serve. And it was used, especially in the New Testament, of the service of the priests and Levites. They were paid to serve God in the temple and to worship. And when it's used of believers, it's used of our worship to God. Let's look at some of the uses. Luke 1 and verse 74. To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Serve him. That's the verb latruo. Have a look at Acts 27 and verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Here the Apostle Paul is giving his testimony during the time of that great storm in his missionary journey, and he says, God has spoken to me. An angel came, and the angel came from the God whose I am and whom I serve. He's using this rather technical use, or using, using this rather technical word, which describes priestly Levitical worship, priestly Levitical service. Now, very important point to grasp here. In the New Testament, priestly language is used of the whole body of Christ, not just of individuals. So we're not talking about a few people who are set aside as priests, not in the New Testament. We're talking about the whole body of Christ being a priestly body, the body of believers. And this also shows us that latris service is corporate rather than individual. So when we serve as priests, we're doing it together. That's why the priestly anointing rests most frequently upon the body of Christ when the body of Christ assembles together. And it is characteristically seen when we are worshipping the Lord. And that anointing comes down. But the worship of God as we sing and praise Him and worship Him must be translated into corporate acts of service that are equally worship as far as God is concerned. We are all called to serve and worship God like priests and Levites with prayer, with praise, with thanksgiving, with spiritual sacrifices and also in practical acts of service. Now, the difference is, is that the priests and Levites were paid and supported for that. We are servants anyway. We don't get paid for worshiping God. We don't get paid for serving God. You know that. Nobody can ever get paid for serving God. Otherwise, it's not serving God. Now, when ministry is supported financially, that's another matter. The Bible makes it clear that you shall not muzzle the ox that treads the corn. But you know, I don't receive a salary. 
I have never received a salary because nobody has ever paid me for what I do for Jesus. Nobody. I do that for Jesus anyway. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? Now, for many years, I have been supported in my ministry. But that support in my ministry is not pay. You see, you see the difference? And so when we serve him, we're not serving him for money. We're serving him because we love him, and if we start serving him for money, we're not serving him. Those two things cannot coexist. We are kings and priests to the Lord. Now we see, therefore, that the heart of ministry is this servant attitude. And uh, let me take you back to Matthew 20 and verse 28, because this to me is the great key text in, in all of that I'm saying today. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be ministered to. He came to minister to others. And that's the pattern. He is the great servant. And uh, when you think about it, of who he was, God manifest in the flesh. When you think of such great pictures of the messianic ministry that we read about in Daniel chapter 7, Look at it there in verses 13 to 14. When we think of this great picture of messianic ministry, no wonder Jesus shocked them when he said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. He's, it says, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one that shall not be destroyed. So who's this speaking of? Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and every word of it is true. He is the king, the one whom nations shall serve, the one whom angels worship. And if he, the Lord, the Master, the King of glory, the Lord of heaven, if he was amongst us as one who serves and that his primary purpose of ministry on this earth was to give his life as a ransom for many, to give his life, to serve others, we cannot take in our mind ruling models of ministry. I don't care how big your ministry is. You could lay hands on a hundred dead people and then they all could be running around living that doesn't make you anything other than a servant of God. A servant. How is it that when a few of us get anointed with some charismatic endowment, which means the gift of God's grace, why do we attract attention to ourselves and say, look at me, look at my ministry, here's my glossy magazine, buy sweatshirts on the counter on the way out, all me, 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 me. That's prostitution of God's gifts. That's merchandising the anointing of God. And that's why the anointing is so rarely seen in its genuine and fullest form. We get just a touch and we get carried away. When Jesus was anointed, he knew his major purpose was to go to the cross. And in going to the cross, he did things on the way. He talked, preached, he laid hands on the sick, cast out devils, called the dead back to life. His purpose was the cross. Now, when we understand, therefore, that this word, diakonos, I'm coming back to the main word, and it's here in Matthew 20, 28. When we understand that this is the word that Jesus used, I've, I, I've come not to be served, but to serve. I've come to be a servant, a deacon, a diakonos. I've come for that. That's the central idea behind all ministry. It tells us two things. It tells us it's the foundation of all true Christian ministry. And secondly, it tells us that it's possible for everyone to be a minister, to serve. If he'd used these other words, huperetes, uh, uh, rather, leturgos, if he used those words, high office, exclusive, some people set apart for that. We wouldn't have understood it. 
But Jesus used this word and he spoke to his apostles, so those who are going to be used in the greatest way imaginable. Peter was there, used so powerfully that his shadow healed the sick. He said, you're a servant. You're a servant. And you minister as a servant. And if that's the case, then we all can do it. And we all must do it because it applies to us all. Do you understand that? Let's get that really clear in our minds. Okay. Acts chapter 6 and verse 2. Let's have a look at this. Uh, and this is a very good passage to study, the whole of Acts chapter 6 here in those opening verses, because, uh, and, and especially when you know that when you read the word minister, behind it is this word diakoneo, to, to serve as, as a waiter, to serve as a servant, a humble servant. And it's used in this context of two different forms of ministry. One ministry which is serving tables, because the whole issue here was that the Greek-speaking Jews, their widows were being neglected. And the Aramaic-speaking Jews, their widows were getting all the best things, all the best supply. And so they had to meet together and sort it out. And, and the apostles said, it's not right for us to leave the ministry God has given us to do something that can be done by others. And he says, they, they say there that that is serving tables, which is the word diakoneo. He says, but our ministry is the word and prayer, which is the same word. So this word is used of what we may think of as spiritual ministry and what we may think of as practical ministry. It's the same word, and that's vitally important. So let's read it. Acts 6, 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 4, Acts 6. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So, God will give us different ministries, but it is ministry nonetheless. That's what it is for everyone. Okay. So, whenever we minister, we serve, whether by polishing or preaching. We follow the same pattern and example of Jesus Christ, who humbly and lovingly served all people. And we see this pattern throughout the whole of the New Testament. Angels minister to Jesus. Women minister to Jesus. Jesus is ministered to in the person of the needy. Believers minister to each other. Ministry, therefore, helps reveal the gospel. 1 Peter 1 verse 12 is a very important text. To them it was revealed not to themselves, but to us that they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Here we have the revelation of the gospel through ministry. Ministry helps accomplish reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. It says, Now all things of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ability to minister is a gift from God. Acts 20 and verse 24. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The ministry... I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a gift from God. So I want to speak to you briefly about the understanding of ministry and spiritual gifts, gifts from God. Now there is a passage of, uh, which speaks of spiritual gifts in uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. And in that passage, there is a special gift of ministering, of serving. And it's the word Diakonia. And so, what this teaches us is that ministry is a gift rather than just a duty. It's a gift. We're privileged to minister. And also, when we see that these gifts are placed, the gift of service is placed alongside some of the other gifts, such as prophecy and showing mercy and so, so forth, leading and giving. Those are some of the other gifts mentioned in Romans chapter 12. What we are talking about is that God will gift us 
in ministry in certain ways. And now here we have the distinction. The term ministry applies to everything that is done in service to Jesus. That's the general use of the word. But there are particular manifestations of that ministry. And that's when the Holy Spirit leads us to do particular things. And that's what this course is going to really be about from now on. We're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit will take the general ministry that is given to us and make it a specific and particular ministry into our lives. Uh, or, well, for other people, but ministry flows from us to them. And I want now to turn again, please, to Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verses 10 and 11. Very, very important verses. So we get this idea absolutely right. Now, in verses 10 and 11, it says, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 11, And he himself, who is Christ, that's the risen Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles, he gave some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay? These are the ministries that most people think about when we talk about ministers. Okay? Now that's, it's right to acknowledge that these ministries exist because they are given by Christ to the church. But that is not the ministry, not really. Those gifts are given to the church to equip the body of Christ for the ministry. So it says in verse 12, these ministries are there for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? A few people selected by some individual, especially holy? No, no, no. That's not the Bible teaching at all. Saints are all believers. Turn to the person next to you and say, Hello, saint. There's Saint Joan. There's Saint Thomas. You are holy by faith in Jesus. That makes you a saint. This is speaking about believers. Okay, saints, don't have too much fellowship now. All right. For the equipping of the saints, what this really means is ordinary believers. For the work of ministry. For the work of ministry. It's a practical purpose to equip you practically for your ministry as a believer. Now, there will be those under the sound of my voice here in this uh, setting, in this uh, sort of the Spirit set, There'll be also those watching on television, those listening to the audio cassettes, those watching the videos, and you know God has called you and separated you to be one of those apostles or prophets and teachers and so forth. Let me remind you that your purpose in ministry is to equip the body of Christ for ministry. You exist for them. They don't exist for you. You are there to serve them and to equip them for ministry. And for all the others who may not be called to that special role of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and so forth, not called to one of the fivefold ministries as a full time, whole life consuming calling, you nevertheless have a ministry, a ministry that must not be neglected. And you must work in that ministry because you will be held accountable for that ministry. When you stand before Jesus in heaven, he will say, what did you do with what I gave you? And that ministry is the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's doing what Jesus did. It includes the practical acts of service, feeding the hungry, which Jesus did, washing the feet, which Jesus did, caring for people practically, which Jesus did, touching people's lives, helping them, speaking to them, blessing them, sharing with them, spending time with them, listening to them, all these things Jesus did, as well as laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ, doing all of these things. That's ministry. So I want you to extend your understanding of ministry. It applies to all of these things. All of these things. And to be really flowing with the Holy Spirit you will need to move in 
at some times in, in a, every one of the things I've just mentioned. Okay, so let me summarize for you four principles that we've been looking at in this opening session to do with diakonos or diakonia, ministry or serving. Number one, it's more the work of ordinary saints than of apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and so forth. Number two, it is the real purpose of the saints, real purpose of believers, just as Jesus came to serve. Number three, it's distinct from teaching, prophesying, pastoring, training. It's distinct from those things. It can include them, but when you minister particularly, you find that it's distinct from those things. In other words, it's not just about preaching, teaching, and pastoring, and so forth. It's about all that you do in serving Jesus. Number four, it's a general expression, a term for all of Christian service, but also there is an opportunity that the Holy Spirit gives you to minister particularly. So it's for you. It's for you in your life and in your experience. And so, we will be looking at how to minister in the Holy Spirit and we'll be concentrating from here onwards probably more on the gifts of the Spirit that are found there in, in the book of Corinthians and how to minister in that. We'll be looking at how you can be laying hands on the sick, ministering to the sick, how you can be setting people free from demons, how you can be speaking prophetic words of authority in people's lives, how you can be releasing people from curses and hereditary bondages, how you could be counseling and touching people's lives. But I gave you this opening session to make you understand that it's not just about those highly charged, charismatic operations of the Holy Spirit. It includes that, thank God, but it includes everything that you do for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the introductory session, and uh, we're going to pause right now, come to an end, and then we're going to come back for the next sessions when we're going to go more deeply into ministry in the Holy Spirit. God bless you. And that brings today's teaching on ministry in the Spirit to a close. I pray that over these programs, God has begun to show you what it means to minister for Him, to be a true servant of Jesus Christ, and to do so in the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Till next time, God bless you.
Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching.